included some icons which link to the, the work I'm involved in. And um, I've circulated through, or Tony has circulated, a chapter from Gender and Environment. And I'm, quite a bit of what I'm saying tonight can be found in there as, as well. Um, and what I wanted to talk about was um, gender and ecological breakdown, but not so much whether it's about men and women, although I am going to talk about that as well, but about masculine uh, masculinities more and masculine forms of behaviour and how that leads to a kind of society which um, has created the kind of problems that Assad was um, talking about. And I'm going to ex explain how that uh, structures gendered injustice, but I do want to propose some feminist solutions. So again, uh, trying to end on a note of some optimism that there's something that can be done about it still at this late stage. Um, the toxic kind of masculinities that we, we face lie behind the ecological breakdown. Um, and it's not only women that are um, dominated, but anything that resembles the feminine and therefore the weak, which of course includes nature, which has been described and conceptualized as feminine or, or female for so long. So first of all, gender injustices. Um, there are, of course, many gender injustices in the world. Between 35 and 70% of women in def different kinds of surveys and extrapolating those report that they've experienced some kind of violence, including sexual violence. And in times of environmental catastrophe or hardship, that increases. And there are quite a few pieces of research on refugee camps, on bushfires, on flooding, on hurricanes. And in each of these cases, the number of uh, incidents of sexual violence against women and girls, children, but most predominantly girls, is higher. And just taking the, uh, I, mean, I should say that my work has been in Europe and North America. Um, I'm, I have done a little bit of work in Pakistan, but my, my expertise, such as it, as it is, comes from um, the richer countries in which there are plenty of poor people, of course. Um, so research in Australia has shown how there is a real gendered response to the bushfires, which are getting worse and worse every year, with men preferring to stay and try and rescue the property, and women preferring to leave and rescue the, the family. And the, that creates so many tensions uh, in families. And also um, a lot of the, uh, those tensions end up in domestic violence. And um, there's social workers in Australia that are writing about the fallout of that. Um, if we look at the literature on um, the follow-up to Hurricane Ka uh, Katrina in 2005, uh, there were incidences of domestic or, or of sexual violence against women in the short-term refugee camps. In long-term refugee camps uh, across the world, but especially um, in uh, some of the African locations, the violence against women is large and also linked to the fact that they're unprotected because women tend to move with their, their children, families, where the men stay behind and fight. Um, but also because they are exposing themselves, going to collect water, to collect food, and so on. There's also the issue with um, in environments being degraded, livelihoods are threatened. And one strategy uh, that women are sometimes forced to use to uh, provide a livelihood for their families is prostitution. There are also instance, incidences where land is being taken out of, um, of subsistence use for ostensibly environmental protection, where women then turn to prostitution. Um, I'm thinking of research in El Salvador in particular. In terms of climate refugees, the um, estimates of climate refugees are between 200 million and 1 billion uh, by 2050 which is probably by now an underestimate. 
and those refugees are particularly at risk. We even know that uh, asylum seekers, uh, asylum seeking women um, are treated badly in this country and there are incidences of sexual abuse there. So one of the gender injustices linked to environmental catastrophe is violence against women. The other um, area is the issue of care. Care work is famously undervalued in all societies. It carries no monetary value um, it's where it's done in the home and is therefore not um, counted in government, um, government statistics. Women are overwhelmingly the main carers. And in times of environmental stress, whether this, this is catastrophic stress like the, the bushfires, like flooding uh, in the UK um, or across Europe uh, or the other catastrophes I have mentioned, it's women that take up the burden of providing the food and the emotional care for their families and for their communities. And then poverty. Um, groups in poverty, communities in poverty, suffer most from environmental degradation. Um, it's sometimes said that climate change is going to affect us all. Well, it will, but it will in different ways. And people who have wealth can buy themselves out of it for at least a short time. Um, but women are overrepresented in groups who are classified as poor. So they will, uh, they have a double burden in that sense. And then the incremental micro injustices, which add up to a lot. So we can talk about the catastrophes of bushfires and um, flooding and hurricanes and so on. But every day, environmental um, degradations take place, which end up making it more difficult to put food on the table, more difficult to heat homes and so on, um, which again, uh, play out in a gendered role, um, in a gendered way. Oh, suddenly I can't move on my, yeah, good. Um, however, women are not in, in decision-making roles in enough quantity to make a difference. And all we have to do is look at the newspapers in any international gathering, and we can see the dominance of male decision makers. And it's not just any old male decision maker. It's not just men. It's men of a particular type, uh, and we can see them gathered together. Uh, they're boys clubs, they network. Um, they're kinds of masculine, it's a kind of masculinity which um, researches into masculinities and thankfully there are more and more men doing this research now. Gender used to be thought to be something only women were concerned with, but hegemonic masculinity or um, industrial masculinity, uh, one writer talks about, and it's um, a dominant form of masculinity which seeks power over anyone, as I mentioned earlier, who over anyone who is seen as weak or as uh, feminized, in other words. And this kind of network um, and power extends to international organizations. So the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, even though it's been headed up by two women who are who define themselves as feminist and who are definitely um, have made some strides and have tried to make some differences, but they are just too few and too small against the, uh, the mass of uh, delegations of uh, COP26, for example, um, that these international development um, organizations and events are kind of they, they work in a way which you know is never going to solve the problems because they're looking at the problem within the existing and the solutions within the existing frameworks. And um, we know from our own experience of women in power that there are women who um, join on that basis, but they're generally not, perhaps with the exception of, of one or two, seen as uh, challenging that at all. And I also think that some of the, um, the international NGOs, because when I was talking about sexual violence in times of environmental catastrophes, um, we recall the ways in which some of the big um, charities have fairly recently been accused of participating in that. 
um, and also covering up what that what was happening within the organizations so this masculine way of behaving and legislating pervades not just governments um, not just businesses but also the the international decision making field in the big charities and the um, big international organizations and that's something that also needs to be challenged um, but I want to then look at some of the possible solutions because uh, a lot of people campaigning on gender justice argue against always framing uh, women as the victim um, and of course it's um, not hard to do that but one of the reasons why there's this differential in experience is the uh, the way in which femi feminist um, ways feminist decisions and feminist ways of thinking about things are not given the airtime but there is um, an emerging feminist climate policy at the international level which comes from a feminist foreign policy which has emerged from scandinavia and i want to talk about that along with some local campaigns which have used gender very imaginatively and have achieved international um, um, publicity through that and awareness. I want to look at how uh, masculinities and particularly, particularly this um, hegemonic masculinity, how it can be challenged. The feminist Green New Deal um, and focusing on cooperation rather than competition. So a feminist climate policy was flagged up at COP26 last year by um, Nicola Sturgeon, who was one of the hosts being in Glasgow, Jacinda Arden, which uh, you all I'm sure will have heard of, and uh, perhaps not so well known, Katrin Jakobsdottir, who is the Prime Minister of Iceland and has been to, since 2017. She is uh, a, from a left green party and rules over a coalition, quite a wide coalition. But interestingly, that coalition has stopped issuing licenses uh, to exploit uh, for oil around the Icelandic coast. And they have a higher carbon reduction target um, with a chance to meet 1.5 degrees, as does New Zealand. But what these three uh, prime ministers did was to make a statement to COP26 which prioritised well-being over economic growth. Um, it's disappointing that reading, um, reading the material around each of the three countries, growth has not been struck from the record yet, but it's being looked at as a means to achieving well-being rather than a means um, in its own right. And then there's a group Okay, there's a group of um, five countries who are called the well-being economy governments and those five countries are these three but with um, Mark Drakeford um, from Wales Mark, and Mark Drakeford and um, Finland under um, Marie, oh, Sanna, uh, Marina Sanna I think her name is and they are they have committed again to prioritizing well-being of course they're all small countries they're small economies um but i think this represents quite an interesting way of uh, addressing global problems um, the other thing is that they all prioritize gender equality and all of them have legislatures which have between 43 and 48 percent of their sitting mps as women the group that I wanted to use um, who are kind of parodying gender really in trying to achieve publicity and outcomes are the fracking nanas who um, have managed well so far we we hold our breath and we send them our support um, but they managed to get the quadrilla fracking um, stopped in Preston New Road and what they've done is they've used gender as um, as a concept and as a publicity a means of publicity to show how important it is to stop fossil fuel um, extraction and they uh, they use traditional tropes they are anything other than what we might consider a traditional grandmother some of them are grandmothers some aren't some are very young all of them have grandmothers of course or have had 
but they use things like tea and cake and knitting and cleaning to make their point and they make that very powerfully usually women's movements don't get too much publicity but they have managed and have done so quite successfully okay um, moving on to work on masculinities i'll focus on the image with the the swimming men but the my colleague in sweden who's done work on masculinities and has especially looking at dominant masculinity and climate denial uh, is now working with men male decision makers in sweden environmental decision makers and trying to get to understand what makes them tick and he's got a project which he calls flow feelers and first of all he got nine participants this is during the COVID time nine participants to read some texts on ecofeminism which i think is probably an achievement in itself um, but then they had a number of discussions over a number of months i think it was nine months and they talked about the quality of the river um, which was running through uh, gothenburg which had been culverted and covered over and they used it as a kind of symbol to try and get to talk about how these men felt about the environment about nature and how they might do things differently um, he's in the process of writing up the research but i was hearing him last week and he was talking about how remarkably the men opened up about their own fears of being shut up um, a bit about being unable to speak uh, he thought COVID-19 might have um, been an aspect of that, which is also an interesting dimension. Um, but he's interested in coming to work with us in Cambridge in the um, um, Friends of the Cam and around that. So if he can work his magic in Cambridge, that would be a real achievement. Um, the Feminist Green New Deal. You coming to an end too. I shall wind up this, I am almost on my last slide. slide. Uh, a feminist new, Green New Deal is being promoted by the Women's Environmental Network as a way of prioritizing care as a green job. Many green jobs proposed don't favor women. So if we look at renewable energy and energy efficiency refits, most of the jobs there tend to go to men. They also argue that care is a low carbon job and adds to quality of life and so should definitely be in Green New Deals. And then finally, I'm going to end with three inspiring women who have all, um, their, their research has flagged the importance of cooperation rather than competition. Suzanne Simard has been one of the leading researchers on how trees communicate and looks at how um, they send messages through the fungal networks underground and has challenged the dominant um, thinking that trees act in their own interests. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer wrote a brilliant book which weaved together traditional um, uh, indigenous knowledge about how we live with nature uh, with conventional knowledge and she's a professor in a um, New England University so she combines two she's also from an in, uh, indigenous uh, ethnic group in North America and Eleanor Ostrom who did win a Nobel Prize in 2009 the first woman to win a prize in economics has challenged the tragedy of the commons which Garrett Hardin said we are all competitive beings and therefore given half a chance we will destroy what's what's given to us uh, for our own benefit, immediate benefit. And she has done research with lots of groups worldwide, or had done, she, she died um, in 2012, and has found that cooperation is actually a much more uh, common form of behaving than competition, and that uh, we need to explore that in more detail and honour that in more detail. Thank you. Thank you.